Our next speaker is the chair and curator of TEDMED globally. Uh, he is also uh, curates, excuse me, the Library of, of the History of Human Imagination. Uh, he is a, a you know, uh, how to describe it? more than many things that this man has done, actually, to answer whatever he is. A, uh, uh, coming from, from a business end of to answer, ladies and gentlemen, and, to, and into the, just the history of imagination and drawing that into the improvement of healthcare. He's very much the sort of vision that's entire, this entire day encapsulate. Um, the title of the event reflects that. Please welcome with this talk on the next revolution in health and medicine, Jay Walker, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dar. <laughs> oh, I always like a very low-key build-up. That works so much better. <laughs> so, good afternoon. You know, when I was asked to come talk with you about the future of health and medicine, I couldn't help but think, to understand or at least envision the future, we clearly have to go back to the past. So how far back should we go to understand the future? And I decided to go back to the beginning. So life began on planet Earth about 3.6 billion years ago. And most people would say, well, that's certainly the most important event in the history of our planet, at least as far as we're concerned, the creation of life. But I would submit it's not the most important event. The most important event is what happened at the exact same time that life shows up. And that is a mechanism by which life gets steadily more complicated. We start with single-cell organisms, and instead of them staying single-cell organisms 3.6 billion years ago, a process that we call evolution begins to kick in and make life steadily more complicated. And after about 600 million years, photosynthesis shows up because natural selection with random variation means that endless changes suddenly combine randomly to tap the energy of the sun. And that happened about three billion years ago. And then it takes another two billion years before the first multicellular organism shows up. Two billion years before one cell life becomes multicell life. And then it takes another hundreds of millions of years before the first animals show up a couple hundred million years ago. And then 40 million, 30 million years ago, the first mammals show up. And all of this makes you wonder, who's in control of this process? How does life get steadily more complicated? Shouldn't it get less complicated? Shouldn't it break down? If I take a tea set, all beautifully organized, and I throw it in the air, what happens? It becomes a mess. Why is life moving in the opposite direction? Now, this is really going to matter, because what happens about two and a half million years ago is one of the millions of animals shows up in the Homo genus, our ancestors. And we're just one of millions of different plants and animals on the Earth. But it turns out that because of our brains, we begin to evolve and get more and more and more sophisticated than every other animal. And about two and a half million years ago, it begins to change for, the, for a radical difference until 200,000 years ago, here's what happens. We show up, modern humans. And that's 200,000 years ago. But here's the big change. 10,000 years ago, we cross a line, and we start to create more sophisticated tools, and we start to create ways to communicate using language, and we start to have imagination. Imagination shows up. Our ability to conceptualize the future, build tools, and manipulate our environment, and what happens 10,000 years ago is man, among all of the animals, takes control of the biological world externally. We invent agriculture, and we invent animal husbandry. And suddenly, we're on a path to control the world. We take control of our food supply, 
And Civilization 1.0 emerges from that moment 10,000 years ago. And for the first last 9,000 years, it's been the same story. Civilizations rise and fall and rise and fall, and some technology gets steadily better. But man is in charge because he owns his food supply, he controls his animals, he plants, he cuts down forests, he depopulates entire species. He takes control, for better or worse, of the natural world of biology. And then something happens about 350 years ago. He uses his imagination again, and he invents a new way to understand the world, a way that involves imagining answers and then testing those answers to see if they might be true and reproducible by others. We call this the scientific method, and it unleashes a torrent of change in the world. In just 350 years, really centered right here in Western Europe and the UK specifically, in 350 years, man uses this new tool, science, to begin to understand what in the past he could not. And then 150 years ago, the Industrial Revolution shows up, and man now is in control of the entire shape of civilization. Only 100 years ago, in 1900, could any of us imagine sitting in this hall, and they sat in this hall 100 years ago, a world of airplanes and the internet and cell phones and antibiotics? Could they imagine a world of television and radio? Could they imagine automobiles? No, of course not. In 1900, the world of 2000 or 2014 is so remote, it's so unimaginable, that in those days, it wasn't even contemplated. Now what's happening? For the first time again in human history, we have reached another point. After 10,000 years, we are about to understand and take control of the internal world inside ourselves and all of biology. We've controlled the outside world not very well, some people would say, but that's nothing compared to controlling the inside world. This is the moment where it's all going to change, and Civilization 2.0 is going to emerge. Now, I know what you might be thinking. We certainly know what's going on in the inside world, don't we? After all, we've got x-rays and MRIs and blood tests and all kinds of things. There's no mystery what's going on inside the world of us. That would be totally wrong. We have almost no clue what's going on inside our bodies. Almost zero. We pretend nicely but we really don't know. For example, heart disease is the number one killer here in Western Europe. It's the number one killer in the United States. For 25% of all people who die of heart disease, the very first symptom that they have heart disease is death. We don't know much about that, do we? Huh? <laughs> For us to spot a cancerous tumor growing inside your body at any point, the smallest cancerous tumor we can find, and that's if we're really looking with the very best equipment available, is 100 million cells. That's the smallest we can find. Do you know that if you have a cancer tumor of 100 million cells, and all cancers start with one cell and multiply, you've had cancer for six years. The earliest we can detect cancer, ladies and gentlemen, the earliest we find it is six years years after it initiates. Does that sound like some group of people that knows what the hell is going on inside their body? No. We make 40 million new cells a second in our body. 40 million. That's 8,000 Albert Halls every second. Each one of them having 3 billion nucleotides and dozens, if not hundreds, of copying errors. We are constantly living in a world of not one organism, but each one of us are a superorganism. The closest would be an Amazon rainforest. There's about 10 trillion of your cells that are human cells in your body. About 10 trillion. Did you know that about 90 trillion cells in your body are bacteria? That's nine to one, ladies and gentlemen. For every one cell of you, there's nine of them walking around. And by the way, these are not bad bacteria. All of the energy from your food that gets to you is all converted by bacteria in your gut. 
if bacteria were considered an organ, they'd be about as heavy as the human brain. And yet it's only been about five or six years where we have begun to sequence the genomes of those bacteria. Before then, we had no idea of the microbiome. We had no idea what was going on. And remember all that human genome things that everybody's liking to talk about, where we finally have the map? Think again. <laughs> the human genome is an instruction plan, that's true. But we've learned that epigenetics, or methylation, basically changes what genes get expressed in your body by the thousands of genes. And you only have about 30,000 genes, right? A lot less than a P, for example. And yet your genes are expressed and upregulated and downregulated. We're just beginning, beginning to understand why certain genes get expressed, certain genes get suppressed, certain genes never show up. We know almost nothing. The example I like to use is imagine watching the movie The Wizard of Oz, which is two and a half hours long, and somebody snipped a single frame out of the movie and said, what's this movie? What's happening here? And you were looking at just one frame of the movie. That's health and medicine today. Now here's what's going to change, and here's why the future is so exciting. Because we're about to understand and take control of the inside world. Well, first of all, what do I mean by understand? I mean we're going to create unbelievably cheap and powerful sensors that we will swallow, wear, breathe on, that will be able to tell us from moment to moment what is going on in the 100 trillion cells? What is going on in all the protein formation? How viruses are interacting with the bacteria and with the human cells? All of that is in the dark right now. But these sensors, they're going to be everywhere all the time. And by the way, they're all coming through the phone. Because the phone is the network device that allows all of this data to come on to a large-scale global network where we can process it and use sophisticated software, sometimes called big data, but think of it as complex software, to begin to interpret what the hell is going on and then provide a feedback loop right back to your phone. See, the future of health and medicine is we're about to figure out what the hell is going on inside. And not just inside of us, but inside of animals and inside of plants. You see that agriculture thing? Well, 80% of the world's crops today are used to raise food to feed animals for meat. That's going away, ladies and gentlemen. We're not going to use 80% of the arable land in the world to, to raise food for animals. We're simply going to produce the meat or print it or whatever you want to call it. And it's going to taste just fine. Right? And not only that, that's 1,800 gallons of fresh water saved for every gallon of meat when you no longer have to grow animals with the agriculture. We're going to change everything we know about ourselves and our world. And that's just the opening act. Because I told you we were going to take control of it. And that's where it gets amazing. You see, 3.6 billion years ago, evolution became the only method by which biology became more and more complicated. But right now, evolution is about to become one of only two methods. For the first time in the history of the planet, we have taken control of the information layer of life. We can literally create DNA and genes, and they can express proteins. We can insert them. We can, as become gods, we can change the genetic code of animals, plants, and all of life. Now, at first, this sounds incredibly frightening, and it is. But the genie is out of the bottle because billions of people are coming onto this network. This is not like nuclear power where a few priests will control it. This is literally going to become planet-wide. And if we may not do it in the West, they'll do it in the East or they'll do it in the South. You see, this is the ultimate change. This is civilization 2.0. We are going to compete with natural selection. It's called synthetic biology. Sounds not too scary. But synthetic biology is the name scientists use to describe the manipulation of the data of life. Now, make no mistake, just as we could not predict civilization 1.0 from animal husbandry and growing crops, we have no idea where civilization 2.0 is going to go when we can start to grab control of the codes 
of the software of life. We've seen it in the last 10 years, where in 10 years we've gone from zero phones to six billion phones on the planet, one trillion apps downloaded, one trillion apps in just 10 years. What happens when we start in the science labs and in students and colleges and universities all around the country and the world, we begin to control? You know, you can mail order the components now, and they will make you your genes and send them to you by Federal Express. And you can put them in a mouse or a plant, and you can see what they'll do. And at first, the reaction is, is this going to be like yesterday, only more? It's not. It's going to be like 1900 to 2000. It's going to be a world both frightening and exciting. But at the core, it's going to be about imagination. If we imagine a world where we use our software writing capacity to improve the world, to reduce the stress on the planet, to change how we live, to cure disease, to prevent, to predict, to participate, all of those things are going to change the way we live, the way our children live, and I guarantee you the way our grandchildren live. So I'm going to bring out on the stage now a man who is at the very front lines of synthetic biology. He's right here from Imperial College. He's the co-director of the, U the UK Innovation and Knowledge Center for Synthetic Biology. If there's somebody who knows, it's Professor Paul Fremont. And he's going to join me. We're going to bring some chairs out now, it would be nice. And he's going to join me on the stage, and we're going to spend a few minutes, and you're going to hear it from him, one of the world's leading scientists on the front lines of what it means to actually take control of the code for life. Professor Fremont, please join us. Hi. Hello, Paul. Hi, Jay. Right. So, Paul, I'm, I'm not an MD and I'm not a PhD, so I'm sure there's a few skeptics in this room <laughs> who are saying, come on, okay? That seems a little bit much. Um, Am I overstating it or not? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> You're not overstating it. This is... Um, we're at a point, I think, where there's a whole confluence of technologies that have just given us the opportunity to start thinking about engineering biology. So this is about bringing engineering practice into molecular biology, into manipulating genes. So you use the term engineering biology. So when I think of engineering, I think of bridges and I think of buildings. Are you thinking engineering in the same sense? We're actually going to make that biologically? Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole basis of synthetic biology, and that's the power of it. Because if you, if you look at this building, for example, there are all these columns, they're all standardized. And this building wouldn't have existed if none of these standard components had been put together in a certain way. Like an airplane you flew over the Atlantic, all standardized components. So now the idea is, well, what about biology? Maybe we can make standardized components in biology. And if you do that, then you start putting them together in different ways, and you start thinking about, what am I going to make? So literally, you take these components and you're going to make things? That sounds sort of Frankenstein to me. Are, are, are we, what are we talking about make here? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Good point. Um, okay, so healthcare, right? So the idea is you start with an idea, imagination. You said it in, beautifully in your speech. Um, you know, what, what are the problems? What, what do we want to tackle? You know, we want to make a new therapy. We want to do something. We want to change. Make a biosensor. You talked about biosensor. Let's make a sensor. So you start with that thought process, then you go and you look at biological systems and you think, well, what parts of biology can I bring to bear on this application that I'm interested in? Then you go on your computer and you start putting together pieces of DNA, you start constructing new genetic circuits that would give you the predicted functionality that you want. So it sounds like if I were in software, I might write a program to make a spreadsheet, or I might make a program to make a word processor, yeah. or I might write an app to do some phenomenal thing to notify people, or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. You're telling me we're going to actually start writing the equivalent code in biology so we can begin to repair things that go wrong? Repair things that go wrong, create new, um, new, new information flow. So generate biology that, uh, that sort of detects uh, its environment, and then, and then constructs information around that to, in order to do something, like a decision-making process. So we're going to engineer cells that will be in an environment that there, there might be a tumor cell you want to tackle. We'll, we'll engineer a cell that will be able to detect just the tumor cell, and when it detects it, there'll be another signal which will say to the, the, the cell you've engineered, 
please release this cytotoxic cargo at this point. And so there'll be sort of information flows, decision making, and engineering going into constructing that. So how broad is this going to be? Is this going to be a few real geniuses over at Imperial College in one or two labs? Or is this going to be something like real software programmers where kids around the world can do it? I'd like to think it would be just Imperial College, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but that ain't going to work. Uh, um, <laughs> No, this is, this, is, uh, this is worldwide, this is, uh, there are school kids, high school kids in America, there are school kids that we go around and talk to are very excited by this, universities, there are citizen scientists, amateur scientists who are interested in biology, who want to get involved in synthetic biology, there are professional labs, there are companies, there is a, there's just a huge ecosystem developing around this field. So, it sounds to me, I'm sure there's always some people who are naturally worried. It sounds to me like the power of a nuclear energy, you know, incredible power once I start to manipulate biology, but without any control. It sounds like there's no way to control where this goes. I mean, is that a fair statement? Yeah, it, it's not really a fair statement. One of the things up front in any synthetic biology, you know, project, design project, is thinking about safety immediately before you've even thought about anything else. So there are, you know, mechanisms to allow your engineered DNA to not be transferred to other cells, to, to the cell itself that you're engineering to self-destruct, that you can reprogram that cell to do something at a particular point. All of the safety mechanisms are really important for the field. We're very, very aware of that. So let's talk about how it unfolds. We saw between 1900 and 2000 engineering sort of unfold across the world. Yeah. Do you see it's going to take 100 years for synthetic biology to unfold? No way. It's happening <laughs> ridiculously fast. Um, I think the, the reality of it is that we've been doing this now for about 10 or 12 years. A full 10 or 12, wow. I mean, in the sense of, well, it's not a long time, really. <laughs> but it's, it's, it seems a long time in the field because it's rapidly uh, gone from writing little apps, little genetic circuits that will do fun things like making bacteria take photo, you know, photograph with bacteria, all that sort of fun app stuff into really quite serious big research projects are now synthesizing new chromosomes, for example, the yeast project making you know, synthetic chromosomes, redesigning chromosomes uh, to, that, would, that would do perform functionalities that we want. So it's just accelerating rapidly. So, so one area of synthetic biology obviously is health and wellness. Yeah. And we clearly want to deal with disease, slow down aging, repair things that go wrong. Yeah. And so those are all right on the radar. But there is more than that in synthetic biology. I know a lot of energy people are pretty excited about synthetic biology. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the really amazing things about synthetic biology, the whole of the application space is extremely broad, from medical healthcare to bioenergy, biomining, believe it or not, bioremediation, all of these activities, biomanufacturing, making stuff, uh, which we've been using biology to do for years, but now we're going to do it just routinely. We're going to change, you know, how we make stuff, you know, how we make all the stuff that we need, you know. Well, it's <laughs> ironic that photosynthesis has done such a great job for everything on the plant kingdom, yeah. And we have to eat those plants in order to get the energy. Do you see a time where we're actually going to be able to manipulate those plants to directly give us energy? I'd like to think so. I mean, the thing about this field, and you just put, your, you put the number on it, which is that this is very imaginative field. This is unlocking people's creative thinking about what applications they would like to do. With biological knowledge having reached a level of sophistication now, People, are, you know, people can think about these things. They can actually, you know, not just think, oh, this is crazy. They can actually think, well, actually, maybe I could do this because there's some really neat bit of biology that I could sort of harness into my design. So a lot of this is about design, systematic design. That's the sort of engineering process. Well, one of the things we see in the world today so much is that because of the web and because of cell phones and tablets, an innovation in China and an innovation in Australia and an innovation in Canada suddenly get, you know, somebody learns about it three days after it happens. Yeah. And so it seems that the speed is accelerating. Is this community actually sharing with each other or are they holding back? I th I'd like to think it's sharing at this particular point in time. Uh, the community is very broad. Uh, there's a lot of very young uh, colleagues involved in the community. Uh, we have this student competition every year run out of MIT. It's got 260 universities from all over the world, every part of the planet. 15 undergraduates all come to MIT and present projects that they've done over the summer. That's been going for now since 2005. All of those people are out there, you know, doing PhDs, postdocs, you know, around the world. And there's a sort of community build uh, around that foundation, uh, and there are other foundations that are being built across the world. So this notion of taking control of the code of life 
Well, that's never happened in 3.6 billion years. Right. All right. So we look out 25, 50 years. Are you encouraged? Are you excited? Are you worried? All of the above? All of the above. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not worried. I am very excited uh, in the sense that, you know, Biology is complicated, uh, and the beauty of synthetic biology by bringing engineering practice in, it tries to reduce this complexity. It tries to remove complexity to allow us to build things that are robust and predictable, like the airplane you came across the Atlantic. That's predictable. It is going to get there, touch wood. Uh, you know, so obviously things can go wrong. Uh, you know, that's part of the risk of all what we do. But it seems to me that you know, we're at this point where this, this is, you know, there are some big problems out there, and this technology could really address some of those problems, and we've just got to take it. Well, Professor Freeman, thank you for sharing and, jo and joining us today. It really was okay, as great. you promised. Thank you. That's all. Thanks so much. Thank you. So it's hard to imagine that something could be happening now that hasn't happened in 3.6 billion years. But natural selection with random mutation has a competitor, and you just met him. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, and all of the young people around the world, and all the scientists around the world that are working in that, and all the rest of us that are waiting for good results for ourselves and our loved one and our children, we thank those scientists for the work they're doing, and we can't wait to see what Civilization 2.0 really looks like.